two degrees is still possible, right? And this is a more positive assessment than we would have made a decade or a decade and a half ago, right? Um, and the reason really is the availability of low-cost options to reduce emissions deeply. And so uh, the latest IPCC uh, report finds that uh, if we used all technologically available opportunities to reduce emissions, we could cut emissions by half by 2030 at costs below 100 US dollars per ton of CO2, which is roughly what you see in terms of carbon price in the EU right now. Could reduce by a quarter uh, at costs below uh, just uh, $20, $30 per, per tonne. That, of course, requires harnessing all of these many, many fold uh, opportunities. And of course, in all of these sectors, there's a tremendous portfolio of adaptation options that have already been identified uh, and, of course, need to be implemented. What makes it possible uh, is, of course, the tremendous progress made in technology, in particular, dramatic cost reductions in wind, solar, energy, batteries, etc., uh, etc. Et right? And so we all know this, but you know, um, it, it cannot be overemphasized uh, just how big a game changer uh, this has been. It's no longer uh, all uh, pushing things uphill. Um, uh, you know, investment in clean energy and industrial systems uh, can pay uh, for itself. Now, what that means is a dramatic upscaling of global investment, not just in clean stuff, uh, but in energy and industrial and transport systems overall, okay? And so uh, International Energy Agency uh, quantifies this uh, as roughly a doubling uh, of annual investment in the, in the global energy sector, right? From $2 trillion US per year, historically, to perhaps 4 or $5 trillion per year, just in the energy sector, okay? So that is, that is huge. What we get in return is a system that will provide energy and industrial services long term in a clean way and at low running costs, right? Um, and so similar is true, of course, uh, in, in adaptation, right? Investments in improving infrastructure, housing, urban systems, flood and fire management, disaster preparedness and response. They're all large upfront investments that will lead economic benefits and societal benefits for a very, very uh, long time to come. Now, the scale of this task is in part what makes it special, right? So we're talking about, you know, what's global GDP? We'll peg it at a, a fraction over 100 tr trillion. So now we're talking about taking 2-3% of that um, and making that extra investment just in energy. Perhaps double that or more if you want to do fully effective adaptation investment. Where are we going to take that from? There's something else that we're going to be doing less of. We're going to invest less in some other things and or we're going to actually increase the investment share in the global economy and reduce consumption share. This is not something that will be popular, right? Reducing consumption share it means doing less of the fun things, holidays, home renovations, right? And more of the essential things for securing the system. And I think what's needed for that is actually a bit of a shift in the public uh, dialogue on these things, right? And you can see that as an intergenerational story, right? And so, the, what's the intergenerational discourse on climate change? Mostly, well, you're stealing our future, right? Um, and so a massive investment push in safeguarding both on adaptation and emissions reductions can be framed and should be understood as this generation's, broadly speaking, um, investment uh, for the well-being of future generations. So, and I think that's actually a big picture narrative that's needed um, to, to underpin all of the efforts that all of you uh, are, are involved in. Now, shift to a renewable energy system. Um, uh, so Australia in the vanguard, really. And if you want to have a look in the future, what it might look like, look at South Australia's uh, electricity supply at any point in time. Uh, this is the last seven days as of last night. And you have periods where the entire South Australian energy supply is fulfilled by wind and solar. Um, other periods where gas still kicks in or imports from Victoria, it's a case like this all the time, looks even better in summer. Um, so uh, we will achieve greater than 80% renewable energy in the Australian grid, uh, but we're not on track to meet that by 2030. Uh, we can, we should, and we need to accelerate renewable energy deployment, uh, but it's not, I would pose, uh, really necessary to meet a particular line in the sand like 82%. Uh, at, at 2030. So 
What do investors need to confidently put a lot of money into more renewables uh, generation infrastructure? Well, there's a difficulty there, and that is that spot market prices will continue to fall as more renewables push in, because renewables can bid in at zero or below zero prices. Um, and so other revenue sources are needed. Dominant support mechanisms at this point in time really are uh, contracts for difference and other government underwritten methods of reducing financial risk. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of calls now to extend the renewable energy target, maybe underpin it with a compliance target. Uh, you know, it's fine, of course, to, to, to help with the voluntary market uh, in terms of green certificates, but if there was a new compliance market, like we used to have under the red, um, then you'll be sending a lot of money to a lot of projects that don't actually need it right, in order to be in existence on the grid, uh, and that means that money will need to come from consumers, any consumers, and in the context of general uh, cost of living pressures, that, that is a bit of a problem. Um, now, we need a lot of action to decarbonize beyond the electricity sector, and we need it urgently. Decarbonization is not some sort of sequential exercise where you do electricity first and everything else later. Um, we, sh we can and should invest a lot more uh, in industrial decarbonisation, in agriculture and forestry, in transport, of course, and there will be important roles, I believe, in these federal government uh, sectoral uh, net zero plans, uh, as well as the, in, in the work that the net zero authority uh, will be able to do in coordinating that, uh, that national uh, effort. Electrification, super important, uh, lots of opportunities to do so. And when you think about this from an investment point of view, the key thing is not to build new kit that uses fossil fuels directly. Okay, that's, that's the single most important thing. So every new traditional car, every new gas appliance or industrial gas using equipment is unambiguously uh, incompatible with decarbonization plans and climate change goals. Okay? So it's really very largely uh, about, uh, about new investments, and if you're looking for simple guidelines as to what is a climate-compatible investment and what isn't, uh, this is one. New stuff needs to be electric. Um, industry uh, safeguard mechanism is providing, will be providing a price signal to invest uh, in, in cleaner stuff. Unlimited access to ACU credits means we don't know just how much uh, action really will take place uh, in industry. And of course, in the agriculture, forestry, land use sector, uh, we should not only be relying on credit schemes, uh, we should regulate uh, and we should buy land of farmers and we should do all of these things uh, directly. Um, of course, diversification of production in agriculture uh, is also a tremendously uh, promising uh, aspect uh, of that shift uh, in, in Australia. Revegetation of marginal grazing land can give us enormous benefits uh, in terms of resilience and lower greenhouse gas emissions. And again, that doesn't need to be happening through a credit scheme. We just simply buy land uh, and or uh, regulate. Now, to finish off with, and this is sort of a long finishing off, Bernie, how are we going with the, no? Yeah, we're fine, okay. So the really large opportunity uh, I would pose to you is in renewable energy-based exports heavy industries in Australia uh, selling into global markets. Um, and so, you know, we, we have that natural advantage uh, for these kinds of industries on the basis of geography, availability uh, of, of practically unlimited amounts of renewable energy at relatively low costs uh, and resource industry uh, experience, right? Not just hydrogen, of course, but hydrogen derivatives, green ammonia, fertilized methanol, uh, synthetic fuels, um, we, we could potentially have a large uh, advantage in uh, synthetic aviation fuel, zero emissions aviation fuel from renewable energy-based hydrogen combined with uh, uh, atmospheric captured carbon. Um, and then the largest opportunity at all, of all, according to, to, to the work we do at ANU anyway, uh, is green iron, really, right? So on the way to green steel, convert some of the iron ore that's produced in Australia um, uh, into iron uh, using hydrogen that's produced uh, from renewable uh, energy. Um, now, uh, that, that's the kind of opportunity that could have similar scale in terms of value added as the output of the, of the coal and gas industries, right? And that's, that's of course, economically speaking, um, uh, an, an important imperative to, to get those opportunities flowing. Um, how to make it happen? Uh, 
we're slow to start, right? So most of Australia's sort of renewable energy export industry still only exists as power points. And so, you know, potentially international off-takers note that as well, right? Where are your projects? Show us the large-scale industrial uh, installations. All we can point to really is the LNG industry. Um, and what is needed to get the patient capital into these kinds of endeavors that are, that are new, right? And that are perceived to be relatively uh, high risk. Do we need an Australian IRA? Right? It's easy to get excited. Let's do this as well. Massive tax credits. Pick some winners. Subsidize them big time. Um, just sort of two cautionary notes on that. Uh, firstly, industry policy, you want to stay close to comparative advantage, right? You don't want to go off in, in, in crazy directions, right? Stretch comparative advantage to new areas, um, but don't try to suddenly compete in fields that you're not going to be able to easily compete in. So, uh, in concrete terms, move from uh, digging up battery minerals to processing them, right? Um, uh, weigh up very carefully whether subsidizing a battery industry in Australia is worthwhile and forget about building EVs, right? Just as an illustration for that. Um, so we need a highly selective uh, approach to, uh, to subsidies. Secondly, um, almost all of this will be for exports, right? It's very different from the US. What are we doing by subsidizing? Well, we're maintaining a below market price for things, which is good for customers. Almost all of our customers will be overseas. Okay, so it really bears thinking about leveraging large-scale taxpayer money into this when we're subsidizing uh, artificially low uh, international prices. Big difference from the, from the US. My final, final point is uh, community benefits from large-scale clean energy industries, right? So the, the big hydrogen and green steel dream, right, has extremely large industries, right, in remote regional and rural areas, okay? So that's a wonderful contribution to global decarbonization, and in some senses, it's the mirror image of Australia's historical contribution to global energy system through coal and gas exports, okay? So that's great. But unavoidably, there will be negative local impacts, right? Obviously, environmental impacts, and these kinds of projects also interact in many ways with indigenous rights and practices, right? Uh, and often it interacts with them in negative ways. And so we need taxation frameworks and or ownership structures that actually ch channel money back to the Australian public via you know, equity arrangements and suitable taxation arrangements. And in that regard, I think what was done with the LNG industry um, is a cautionary tale of what should not be repeated uh, with those new clean energy industries. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Frank. Now, please, if you can um, shoot your hands straight up. We only have a few minutes for questions. We have one right here, if we can get the microphone to there. While we're waiting, Frank, I just want to say how great it is to hear you say these words. This is my takeaway from here. Don't build new things that use fossil fuels. That is the most clear economic speak that I support in a long time. Uh, I will just question you on, you said that I'm um, reducing consumption, so we'll miss out on some of the fun things like home renovations. Frank, you've clearly never renovated a home in your life. Furthest thing from fun on the planet. Yes, over to you. You're, identify yourself, please. Uh, Jim Buckley, uh, Climate Energy Finance. Thanks, Frank. Um, we've touched a little bit. You mentioned in your speech green iron value-add exports could be equal to Australia's fossil fuel exports. I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on that because I think that's absolutely the punchline. But can you elaborate on the scale and suggest what policy mechanism beyond patient capital would us, will get us there? We don't have a price signal for it. Are you suggesting BHP and Rio should actually just lead? Uh, yeah, okay, so firstly on, on, on the scale of this, right? So we are the largest global iron ore exporter, right? It's really a <laughs> very massive industry. Um, and still most of the value add, right, is actually not in Australia, it's in China, and Korea, Japan, elsewhere, India increasingly, right? Um, and so if you fast forward a few decades into a future where the world actually takes climate change seriously, right, then that sort of seven, eight percent of global emissions that comes from the steel value chain needs to be eliminated, right? The technologies are currently being developed, okay? And the question is, this is, this is actually R&D kind of territory, right? Some basic research even. Which iron ores are suitable for what kind of clean 
iron and steel processes. If we can hack it to have uh, the Pilbara iron ores, you know, both magnetite and hematite, um, suitable for these green iron processes, right, then the value add from that will be larger than the value of the iron ore industry, right, which is on par with coal and gas, right, simple as that. Um, what do we need to make it happen? There is actually, the, more, the biggest thing is innovation, right, the biggest thing is R&D, right, because it is really still an open question which processes will win out and how they relate to the different uh, iron ore types. Government subsidies, well, this is, this is so large, right, um, and the profits in the iron ore industry are so huge that you'd really think the money will need to come out of the industry, you know, um, and that's, that's probably, my bet is it'll be iron ore producers trying to safeguard their production by, by trying to kick off a, a green iron industry in Australia. Mm -hmm.